This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amaretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. Well, here we here, here we are again, uh, and and the and the pre-show talk continues. We were just talking about coffee, cold brewing. What the uh, chatting with Jeff and Aaron about their coffee experiment. Uh, Jeff and Aaron had a chance to get together, and uh, we'll share that here in just a little bit. But uh, first off, start out. Uh, this is the Mead House, and. If you're into making mead like we are, this is the show that you really need to be listening to. This is just uh, the four of us making making uh, mead at home and uh, kind of learning from each other uh, as we go here. Uh, some of us have a little bit more experience than, than others. But, uh, hey, uh, you know, uh, if you're listening to uh, the Mead House, then uh, we're glad you are. And hopefully you're going to be making some pretty good mead at home, too. Um, every Tuesday night at 9 o'clock live here, you can catch the, the replays after the show, usually about a 24-hour turnaround, themeathouse.com. We're listed on iTunes, Stitcher Radio. And, of course, if you download the app, you can take the live show with you if you're traveling. Um, we do have uh, a Facebook. It's just simply The Mead House. Uh, feel free to uh, cruise around there. TheMeatHouse.com is our house, and you can call the show live. Feel free anytime, 818-921-4680. Uh, Aaron Martin in the house, along with Mississippi Chris Spencer, Jeff Joss, and, of course, me, J.D. Webb. Uh, a couple of shout-outs here tonight, guys, before we get started. Uh, the first one goes out to David Schumacher. He was asking uh, a question on the Meat Group page. Uh, how do you aerate without making a mess? Apparently, he, uh, he's he got a one-gallon batch of uh, cur- black currant and a wildflower mead, and apparently he just he just stuck his whip in and just made a mess. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think, uh, first off, I think rather than – and I learned this lesson – a long time ago, first time out, when I started doing, you know, the, the small batch, one gallon stuff, don't do it in a glass carboy. Start with a two gallon uh, food grade container, be it a bucket or some kind of, a, you know, a plastic uh, tub, even a Tupperware container has got a, you know, lid uh, that you can seal it off uh, pretty well. Uh, but don't use the glass carboys because you're just, you know, uh, and it really, you know, picky yeast. It really doesn't matter. Uh, by the time you fill your carboy up and you start jostling it around after she gets going, it's probably going to boil over on you and cause the mess. So, uh, lesson learned, uh, by me early on, forget the glass carboy, do it in a, uh, some other kind of container, a larger container, like a two gallon container. You got plenty of head space, you know, you can stick the whip in, stir it up, and, uh, that way you won't make the mess that's so common with these one gallon carboys. The second, uh, shout out goes to Beth Lee. Uh, caught up a post, uh, with her in the, uh, wine and mead making Facebook page. And she was talking about, uh, actually, she was asking about racking a Joe's Ancient, or it looked like a Joe's Ancient, it turned out it was, uh, Joe's Ancient Orange Meat. Typically, that's the one that uh, everybody likes to start out with for some reason. Uh, apparently, it had cleared before the fruit dropped, and several people responded. And uh, some people said, yeah, go ahead and rack it into a, uh, you know another carboy. Of course, I went in with a few others and said, nope, don't don't touch it. Leave it alone. And uh, I want to make this comment first. And this is another lesson that I learned a long time ago. And we had Joe Mattioli on the show uh, when I was with GodMead.com. 
When you're doing the Joe's Ancient Orange Mead, he's very specific about the instructions. If you don't follow the instructions exactly as he has it laid out, don't expect the best results. Uh, there's a reason why he, uh, you know, his method uh, is what it is, and that's for good results. And I believe somewhere in those instructions it says, wait until the fruit drops before you do anything with it. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't do nothing after you put your yeast in and, and seal it off with an airlock. Um, you know, if you're going to do that, uh, uh, you know, follow the instructions exactly. But better yet, uh, an even better way, uh, go back to the beginning of the Mead House show, March 22nd episode. Follow along with the orange blossom mead. It's a very simple, easy to do recipe that we take you through step by step by step. Uh, and if you follow along and, and do like we do, and I believe our, uh, the recipe is even posted on our website, themeathouse.com, uh, you should see good results from that as well. Uh, I would, you know, I, I would much rather you do that than start off with the Joe's Ancient Orange. A lot of mixed reactions about the, uh, the Joe's Ancient Orange. But uh, at any rate... Uh, we're all here tonight. It is Tuesday night. Uh, Aaron, what are you drinking tonight? So tonight I've got a bottle of this Island Orchard Apple Cherry Cider. This is an apple cherry cider handcrafted in Door County, Wisconsin. That's the uh, little peninsula there that juts out on the northeast side of the state here. And uh, they're very well known for their cherries up there. Uh, you go up there and you'll just find all kinds of cherry jam, cherry pie, cherry salsa, and apple cherry cider. So this is made with uh, Mont Morinci cherries, a, a nice tart cherry. It's about 6.5% alcohol by volume and uh, just nice, light, refreshing, uh, definitely a nice uh, summertime kind of beverage here. Outstanding. And, you know, before we went live, I was listening to everybody yakking, and suddenly I heard this this little pop of a bottle, and it sounded like a clink of a glass, and, you know, the liquid pouring into the glass, and that was Aaron pouring his glass of, uh, of uh, cider. So we just <laughs> record that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jeff, uh, what's in your glass tonight, bud? Well, I'm, uh, I'm doing something a little bit different tonight. I... Um I have a cocktail in my glass, actually. My wife had her oh, birthday this weekend, and um, she is a, a big fan of gin. So I found a gin cocktail that uses uh, what's called the Bee's Knees. It uses gin, um, some simple syrup made with honey, uh, which is where the name comes from, and a little bit of lemon juice. And it's uh, pretty pleasant. I ended up making a big picture of it for the party, and so I'm, I'm trying to, to do my part to get rid of the, uh, the last dregs of that. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Mississippi Chris, uh, our chicken farmer who does heart surgeries on the side. What's in your cup tonight, bud? Well, I've got a cup of coffee that I'm going to be tasting along with you. Uh, it's some of the coffee you sent me for our uh, experiment. So uh, I'm, I don't have a, an embodiment tonight. Okay. I do. Uh, I actually have, and this is going to happen after I down the coffee, but uh, I've got a, I call it very berry country wine. Uh, this was uh, an experiment I did. It started out as a one-gallon experiment, quickly grew to two gallons by the time I got all the ingredients in. Um, I don't remember. Oh, I know. Yeast uh, Pasteur Red. Uh, yeast is what I used with this. I started out with a gravity about 1.120 or so, and I just let it ride until it quit. So it's on the, a little bit on the dry side, a little tiny bit of sweetness when it first hits the mouth, but it's just a basic sugar wine. Uh, I think it was five and a half pounds of sugar when I got all done, or three and a half, something like that, but uh, kind of tasty, actually. Um... <coughs> The orange blossom traditional, I know we're a long ways into this thing, and we have probably bottled it by now. Um, 
And uh, what do we do from here, guys? We're just going to leave this thing sit for a while. I think we probably have a few more months and just kind of wait it out, I think, to get the best results from it. Yeah, it's it's probably still clearing in the carboy. Uh, it probably has. When did we start it? In March, was it? Yeah, March 22nd is uh, the show that we put the recipe together. Yeah, so we got about another month or so in the carboy and then ready to bottle. And if you did everything right, like we laid out, it should be ready to drink uh, in about another month. Yeah. Maybe yeah. even now. Yeah, it could be. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of that depends on temperature as well. Uh, you know, if you've got a, a high ambient temperature inside your house, uh, maybe, it, you know, it might take longer. If the ambient temperature is a little on the cool side, maybe it'll cool, uh, it'll clear a little little quicker. Um, yep. But either, either way, uh, a little time, uh, you know, don't rush it. Uh, if it's ready to bottle, if you haven't already, if it's clear, go ahead and bottle it. You can age it in the bottle for a while too. So, uh, time, uh, you know, time does mead some good in, you know, probably 95% of, of the cases. So, if you, uh, if you did everything according to the instructions and everything went well, um, it will be, really good in another month and it'll knock your socks off in a year from now. Yeah. So if you did make it along with us, um, you know, stick a couple of bottles back for, for about a year. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I gotta go back to the, uh, the shout out that I was talking to Beth Lee. Uh, you know, she, um, was working on that Joe's Ancient Orange, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I kind of think that, you know, if, if you really want to do a mead to see if you really like this stuff, I really think that that Orange Blossom, Orange Blossom, what are we calling it anyway, Orange Blossom Special? <laughs> uh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, Orange Blossom Special uh, mead that we threw together. Uh, you know, you might want to do that. Uh, in place of a Joe's Ancient Orange, uh, you know, I don't know what you guys think. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, I would. <laughs> Aaron, uh, you had some or Jeff, rather? Yeah, yeah, I would just definitely do something other than a Joe's Ancient Orange, as I understand it. You know, the, the idea of the Joe's in Ancient Orange is to do something easy and relatively quick. It's not necessarily supposed to be good. Um, right, and. Yeah really a lot of the technique you get from doing the Joe's Ancient Orange is just sloppy work, really. And you, you need to unlearn that to make good mead later. Yeah. So. And for those of you who did make it like I did, um, and you've got it sitting around and you don't know what to do with it, but you don't really want to drink it, uh, Jeff mentioned uh, making cocktails. You can make a mead mosa. A mead uh, mosa. There you go. Yep. Either some seltzer water or some Sprite or Seven Up. I'd probably go with the with the seltzer water because uh, you don't really want to add any more sweetness to it than it already has. Uh, but fizz it up a little bit and makes a good mead mosa. Yeah, you know, and I, I got to throw the disclaimer out there too while we're talking about this. You know. Uh, this isn't to say that what Joe did or the recipe that he put together just, you know, flat isn't any good at all. You know, Joe Mattioli worked long and hard on that recipe, uh, batch after batch after batch. Of course, we're going way, way back in the, in the early days of, uh, of mead making. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a batch if you've never done and, and, you know, you want to see what happens. Uh, you know, at, you know, when you make meat, I suppose that's a pretty good starting point. But, you know, if you're really serious about wanting to put something together that's, that's wonderful to drink, uh, you know, we suggest that you stick with the recipe that, uh, you know, we put together. And it is listed on the meathouse.com. Uh, you can uh, look for it, uh, there. But, um, the, um, the coffee thing, uh, 
we're kind of in the middle of this coffee experiment, uh, the four of us actually, uh, and we're going to get to uh, uh, Aaron and Jeff here in a minute because they're kind of going off in a little bit different direction than what Chris and I are doing, uh, which is okay. Um, this is purely experimental at this stage. I came home from vacation with three different uh, types of coffee. And Chris and I, I, I sent some to Chris, and we uh, were going to go through a kind of a tasting phase to kind of figure out, you know, where we stood with each one of them. Uh, one is a Tanzania pea berry from the slopes of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, another one was a Kenya coffee bean, obviously from Kenya, Africa, supposedly one of the finest beans, uh, you know, uh, to make coffee with. And then a uh, Costa Rica roast uh, comes from a single estate uh, from Manzanita Roasting Company in, uh, in, in uh, Poway, California. And I'm about to taste, Chris, the Tanzania pea berry cold brew that's what I have and uh, it's it's not bad actually uh, it's got a nice smooth coffee flavor very weak extremely yeah. uh, of course um, why, why, why don't you explain how this cold brew was put together <clears throat> well uh, we put uh one cup of room temperature water with one ounce of ground beans. Uh, we let that sit for 17 and a half hours, <clears throat> strained it, and then we added three more cups of water. Uh, this particular dilution simulates the same thing we would do on a larger scale uh, if we were making... Uh, the mead, according to Eric Newquist's um, method that he told us about. So um, <clears throat> we're we're looking at a, making a one cup concentrate and then diluting it with three parts water. And uh, you know, it really held on to a lot more coffee flavor than I expected it to. Yeah, I. Um... Well, I got to think about that Tanzania. That that's actually pretty good. Uh, that's the one that I have not had hot yet. Um, I did. I haven't either. <clears throat> I haven't either. Yeah, I, I, I had a, I had a cup of the Costa Rica, and I got to say, I'm just I'm not quite there with the Costa Rican uh, uh, roast. It's just it's it's, it's, uh, it's in third, third place. <laughs> yeah, it's it's in third place right now for me too. Yeah. Um, uh, this uh, Tanzanian pea berry, um, you know, between it and the Kenya, it's kind of a toss up. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to put this one in second place. Yeah. Um, right now, I'm drinking Kenya, and uh, that was my favorite out of the two hot brews that I made. Uh, I just the Kenya, it just tastes like a good cup of coffee to me. Now, I'm not, you know, I, I love a good cup of coffee. My favorite beans are Arabica and Sumatra. And I like the dark roast. But uh, I'm not such an aficionado that I could sit here and analyze this taste and tell you, you know, uh, about the different flavors and whatnot. It smells good. It smells like a, a decent cup of coffee. The Kenya coffee uh, has a little bit richer flavor to me than any of the other three. Uh, but the Tanzania uh, has a very good flavor as well. But I, I'm going to rank the Kenya as number one, Tanzania number two, and Costa Rica three, I think. Yeah, me too, because um, – and, and the reason Kenya is beating out the other one is because the Kenya has a little bit more acidity, and and I like to have a little bit of acidity there um, 
you know, that it just adds some sparkle to the mead, and I think that's going to come through. There you go. Yeah, I'm. I um. I, I you know I had the cup of Kenya uh, coffee last night, and uh, I really enjoyed that cup of coffee. I mean, I, I I wanted more. It left me with wanting more. So, but I'm also eager to try the Tanzania too. So, uh, right now, as it sets, the Kenya is in first place, and I think you're right about the acidity. Uh, you know, I think a little bit. Of, I mean, even in a mead. I mean, uh, let's just you know, let's get uh, our judges' uh, input here, Jeff. A, a, a little bit of acid is okay, right? Oh, a little bit of acid is desirable. I mean, really, I want a good balance between acid and sweetness when I'm tasting a meat. I, I don't know if that's the uh, across the board for other judges, but they got to balance out a little bit at least. I mean, you, you don't want one dominating over the other. Of course, the, I, I, I think, Chris, the acid that we're talking about here in coffee is is going to lend to that bitterness uh, that we talked about as well. Uh, you know, the yeah, and uh, we have. you know, when when you and I discussed this, we we had said we were going to start this mead at a, a starting gravity of eleven thirty, yeah, which is going to put us ending up somewhere around uh, the mid ten twenty range, ten twenty four, yeah, or something like that, right. and. I got to tell you, uh, this cold brewed coffee has got such a perceived sweetness almost. It's so mellow, and it's so much different than the hot brew that I'm used to drinking. Yeah, I'm not really sure we're going to need that much sweetness left over. You know, what, what do you think? I'm not either. But then on the other hand, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know that four ounces is going to be enough. My coffee habits uh, are kind of dictating my uh, my taste, of, you know, with this mead. And yeah, me too. And and I keep trying to think, you know, we don't want this to be uh, just a, a brewed, fermented coffee. We right. we want we want a good balance of. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult enough to get any honey to come through over the coffee. Yeah. And and I was really s- skeptical about using only that amount of coffee in a whole gallon. But, you know, now that I'm tasting this, it's one of those things where, like, you know, you take the first sip of the coffee and it's really weak compared to what you're used to. But then as you sit and drink it, it sort of builds. Yeah. And I think you know, uh, I, I kind of treat it like a I, I, I kind of treat it like a nice whiskey. Okay, uh, you know when you, when you take a sip of good whiskey, it, it doesn't you're not going to get that. Uh, it doesn't taste like an oak tree. Uh, it tastes like a nice whiskey with a little bit of that woodsy aftertaste, and that's what I'm looking for in this coffee. I think. Uh, mm. You know, I don't. Uh, when I take a sip of this coffee meat, I don't want it. I don't want it to explode coffee in my mouth. You know, uh, like mm-hmm. a good whiskey. I don't. I, I don't want it to taste like an oak tree right off the bat. I want to taste the flavors and everything, and have that coffee come through more, more towards the end, the middle towards the end. I think. Uh, yeah. So I okay so uh I think I know where I sit uh without even having the hot cup of coffee going to have it anyway but I don't know that that's going to change my mind. Now the next question is uh do we leave the recipe alone or is 4 ounces we're going to stay with 4 ounces then? I would say yes. Yeah. Uh, because I think we're, I think we'll accomplish everything you just said. I think it's not going to be overwhelming, but it's definitely coffee flavored. Yeah. But it's still tame enough so that the honey will have a chance to come through. Yeah. I think. <laughs> now, are you going to leave it at 1130 like you planned? 
Oh, we're going to leave the gravity alone? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, because if we if we decrease the amount of honey, uh, we're just decreasing the character. And like I said, it's going to have a hard enough time coming through anyway. Uh, so I guess we're just going to have to deal with the sweetness level, and we'll hope that this acidity in the Kenya sort of comes through and balances it. Um you know, which now has got me wondering, uh, of course, you know, this this kind of thing raises a million questions. Um, it's, it's but and, you know, after, this is this is Jeff's world. This is Jeff and Aaron's world. I mean, isn't doing experiments kind of fun? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but you know, I'm thinking that the, everyone says that cold brewing helps to reduce the acidity, and I think it does definitely oh, yeah. uh, after tasting this. But after we do this initial experiment with the cold brewed coffee, I'd like to get some more Kenya and and maybe try one and do everything exactly the same, but hot brew it instead to get a little more of that acid and. Uh, you know, just see how it balances with the sweetness. I have to go back to that coffee deal that I put together before I left for vacation, and uh, I still have it. It's, it's still sitting in the in the uh, gallon, actually the gallon and a half jug. And uh, when I tasted it, and I taste it, you know, every few days, it's still. Uh, it was way too much coffee. I can tell you that a pound and a half in a gallon and a half of, of mead is way too much. I, this is, and this is a dark roast. Uh, and um, the bitterness, it, it really comes through more so in this mead than it does in a cup of coffee. Now, maybe because, I kind of enjoy that bitterness in a hot cup of coffee. I think that actually lends to the flavor. Uh, mm-hmm. You know. Uh, well, you and I both are having the same problem. We're trying to take something that we really enjoy, which is a strong, dark roasted cup of coffee, and we're trying to put that behind us and and translate it over to a mead and without having ever tasted one. Yeah. Uh, no, see, I've already been ask. through this whole thing. I've been through this whole thing with the heart murmur. I'm trying to replicate something that I've never tasted. Go so. ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, that's on that. Yeah, I, I just had a, a thought here. When you say it's it's really bitter, the bitterness comes through. Is it bitter in an unpleasant way to you? Because I mean, oh, yeah. like you said, I, when I drink a cup of coffee, I expect some bitterness. I mean, I take that black, and I bitterness is part of the ride for me. I, I yeah. want it to that flavor, but is it unpleasant in the mead when it's that strong? Yeah, it you know, and, and it may be it, it may have something to do with the sweetness level too. I don't know because I don't drink my coffee. I, I drink it straight up. Uh, like, oh yeah, I like you know, like I like my whiskey. I don't like you know. When 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 a whiskey maker good, makes a good whiskey, why the hell would you want to dilute it down with this, that, and the other thing, even an ice cube? I just don't do that. Good tequila, the same way. Coffee, absolutely. Straight up black. Uh, and you're right. The bitterness lends to the flavor. But when you start adding a level of sweetness to it, uh, especially, and we're not talking sugar here, which I think would be different than using honey. We're talking honey. It just, I, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't work. Uh, but that being said, like I, you know, I, I put a pound and a half of coffee in this thing that I have here at home, and it's way, it's overboard. It's way overboard. So. And JD here. was was that cold brewed as well? Did you say? Yes, it was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it mm-hmm. was cold brewed, but uh, the dark roast. Uh, I think uh, you know, and Eric was pretty clear about uh, about it too. He he, 
uh, you know, he uh, almost insisted that a medium roast is going to do better than a dark roast when it comes to the acidity and the and the bitterness level. So, and I also remember him talking about how the uh, the cold brewing allowed you to taste the actual bean. Yeah. Uh, JD, the, I'm, I'm, this is the first cold brewed coffee I've ever had. Uh, but if you if you if you notice this, uh, take a sip of that that Tanzanian pea berry, and you're actually tasting. If you can imagine uh, sniffing the container after you just finished grinding it, you can actually taste the like the husk of the bean. Yeah. And you're you're getting a much truer representation. So. You know, I think he was on to something when he said cold brewing is the way to go with it. Yeah. Uh, exactly, but, yeah. but my my sense of experimentation is not going to let that be well enough uh, alone because uh, I'm going to have to put together a hot brew uh, on the side just to see. Yeah. Um Yeah. I You know, I, I like both the Kenya and the Tanzania, but the Kenya just... Kind of, kind of, just outdoes the Tanzania here for now for me. So, yeah, I think the Tanzanian bee berry would be really good if if you finish the mead drier. And well, well, let's talk about that for for a second here. Uh, you and I had a conversation earlier in the week, and we talked about doing actually two batches instead of one. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've got an idea for something that I want to try uh, as a as a second um, experiment, just on my own, just because of my own curiosity. And uh, what it involves is sort of a hybrid uh, brewing process. Uh, it's called a hot cold brew. Um, and basically, what you do is you take your uh, your water. And you divide it up into, you know, uh, like take one third of your volume of water and you take two thirds of your water and you chill it. You take the one third that you taken out and you boil it. Okay. And so you put your grounds in your container that you're going to cold brew in after it's ground and you, you boil that water, take it off the boil for 30 seconds. And after it's been off the boil for 30 seconds, you pour it in and it allows the, the, uh, uh, the hot water will extract some of the things that can't be extracted in a cold process. But then you immediately pour the chilled water in. So, then you go through the same process of waiting for 12, 18, 24 hours, however long you cold brew for. Yeah. And so basically what you're doing is you're getting the benefit of extracting some of the acid, but you're avoiding, you're still avoiding the bitterness of a hot brewed coffee. Yeah. So um, I'm going to try that. As a, uh, and I'm going to use the Tanzanian pea berry since it came in second place. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to try it and see what happens because it, it's uh, lower on acid than the Kenya anyway. So who knows? I may be able to extract a little bit more acid, uh, and and it may be on par with the Kenya. Yeah, because actually, with for me the, the the actual flavors, if you disregard the acidity and the richness, the flavors are pretty much on par already. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, so uh, I, I was actually thinking of taking that Tanzania and lowering the amount of honey, uh, bringing the gravity down to. I don't know, something around two zero, two five, not mm-hmm. not more than two five to start. Uh yeah. and uh, go a little bit drier with it. Yeah, I think maybe uh just start at eleven twenty and um Yeah. And something like that. I think that would be perfect. And I and I really believe after we do this first experiment 
I think we're going to be sitting around wishing that we had started it at 1120 as, as well, but yeah. let's not mess with it now. Let's proceed with the recipe as is and, and well, let's, let's see what uh, happens. Let's, uh, let's get uh, Jeff and Aaron involved here. Now, uh, they're also going to do a coffee meat experiment. Uh, experiment, experience, uh, I guess you could call it. Um, but they're going in a little bit different direction. Uh, Jeff, why don't you explain uh, what you and Aaron are up to? Well, sure. We had a uh, – I had a thought regarding um, – we were going to do a little bit different with this and it occurred to me that we wanted, you know, that, that nice dark roasty flavor from the coffee to come through. And one way we could do that would be to use more of a Boucher style, which is the, uh, where the, the, the honey is caramelized beforehand. Um, so I think we're going to try that. And I'm not sure, you know, the, the more I hear you guys talk about this cold brew thing, I'm not sure I want to take it quite as dark as I'm used to. Um, or if I want to go more in a, um, a, a kind of a, a medium dark with that and let that kind of play with the coffee, um, that, that's going to take some more thought on my part, I think. But, um, yeah, I think caramelizing the honey beforehand will give us some interesting results and it should hopefully play nicely. <laughs> what do you think about that, Aaron? I, I just have to say when, when Jeff came up with that idea, I just, immediately lit up. I, I think it's, um, a, a Boucher is something I've, I've been wanting to play around with. It, it's something that's just really fascinating to me. And, um, I, I think like Jeff is saying, just the, the flavors that you get there with kind of the, the dark roasty toasted marshmallow type flavors would really play well with, with a good coffee flavor. Yeah. Hey guys, uh, my wife just brought me a cup of my regular coffee, just hot brewed coffee like I normally drink. Yeah. And and I was just sitting here finishing off the, the cold brewed cup and I knew it was smoother and less bitter, but I didn't realize how much until I took a sip of the hot brew uh, right behind it. Yeah. Uh, if you wanna if you wanna notice the difference, I mean this is bitter. <laughs> Yeah. We're so used to drinking it, we maybe we don't realize how bitter it really is. But after drinking that cold brew, uh, this that I normally drink is extremely bitter and and harsh tasting almost. Compared, yeah, compared to the cold brew. Yes, yes. So I didn't realize how smooth the cold brew really was. Well, that was the difference that I tasted in the hot brew versus the cold brew of the beans that we're using here. Uh, like I said, I had the Kenya last night. I tasted the Kenya cold brew today. Stark difference when it comes to the the bitterness, the acidity level, that kind of thing. Uh, very stark difference. Uh, but I, I find them both very enjoyable. I mean – you know, we've, we've already talked it to death. There's, 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 there's a reason for bitterness in a hot cup of coffee that I think adds to the flavor. And, and I, I can't do without it. I mean, I, I can't, I, I cannot drink cold brew coffee. I got to have my coffee hot brewed. But that's just me. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Jeff and Aaron, um, uh, Let's talk about the beans. I mean, you're you're talking. Uh, have you have you selected a bean at all, or are you thinking about a particular kind of bean, a particular? Uh... Well, Jeff has has suggested a, he's got a couple local coffee shops that that have some interesting beans, and, and maybe I'll let Jeff talk about you know one or two or a couple of those. Um, one of the things that we have not selected a bean yet, and one of the things I'm, I'm interested to kind of pick Jeff's brain on a little bit is is what he's looking for here. I, I think um, my first thought would have been to go with something a little bit darker of a roast just because, you know, Chris and Jeff, like, like both of you, 
when I think of a, a good cup of coffee, I think of a real dark roast, a you know, Columbia Supremo type of, of a roast. Um, I like mine black too, you know, just a real nice, strong cup of coffee. And, and that was my first thought is to go there. But, you know, JD, as, as you're talking about, um, that other coffee experiment that you've got going on with one and a half pounds of, of a darker roast and, and how that's, you know, un, unpleasantly bitter. And then couple that with the fact that, that we are talking about a Boche style, which is going to contribute more, you know, dark roasty type flavors to the mead. Jeff, I'm, I'm starting to think, you know, maybe we need to, to look at more of like a, a lighter roasted bean type of a thing. So, so what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, and, and this is, this is a complicated question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that it is. That it is. Chris really and I is. have spent hours discussing this whole thing. So <laughs> go ahead, Jim. You know, so, you know, I, I tend to go for like a Sumatra or a uh, like an Italian dark roast if I'm going to pick coffee for my personal consumption. Um, but, yeah, no, from, from what we've heard here, it does sound like a medium to a light roast is definitely the, the winner for the evening. Although I would be curious to try this with a uh, – with a darker roast at some point too, just to kind of see if that, that can be mitigated with the cold brew, uh, or how badly that comes out. Um, it, it does sound like we, we need a nice, um, a medium to a light roast. And really what I'm looking for when I, uh, when I'm going to select beans and stuff is more like a, a full body than anything else. I think, uh, a lot of different flavor and a lot of stuff going on. Uh, case in point, um, my wife happened to get for free some, some, uh, it was a, a pea berry, although I don't remember the, the location it came from, but it was from Caribou Coffee, which is, uh, operating locally. And she just happened to get a bag of freshly roasted beans from them over the winter that was a light roast, but it was actually very flavorful when I brewed it up because I'm not going to turn away free coffee. Right. I, I just drink too much of it to say no. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's like when somebody hands you a bottle of free whiskey. You don't care where, where the hell it comes from. You're going to drink it. Even if it's rock gut, you know, I can mix that with something. Break with tradition and say, hey, let's make a, like a mixy, mix, yeah, whiskey sour or something. Yeah. Man. <laughs> there you go. It'll get the job done. Maybe a um, whiskey J Ohm. Well, yeah. <laughs> don't, uh, one thing I got to say here, though, don't don't uh, you know, don't use my my first coffee deal here at home uh, as as a guide because you know a dark roast may very well work. Uh, keep in mind that I used a pound and a half. Yeah, are, that is a key point. <laughs> yeah, what Chris and I are doing is just four ounces, and uh, and and that's four ounces that ultimately will wind up in a gallon of water. I did a pound and a half uh, in a gallon of water, and by the time I got the honey and everything all mixed in and the gravity right, it was about a gallon and a half. But you know, yeah, we're using one six that amount. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, so a dark roast may very well work. I mean, you, you know. Well, and, and one other thought I'll throw out there too. So Jeff and I were also contemplating starting at a little bit higher of a starting gravity. And, and I don't know that we have this locked down or locked in just yet, but we were thinking of starting at – uh, 140. So wow. if we were to do that, maybe the darker roast and kind of an increased, you know, acidity or bitterness would would be well to counterbalance some of that that extra sweetness. Yeah, and you got to think about if you're doing a boche, you're going to be creating some uh, some sugars that can't be fermented. So. Um, not only are you going to have your residual sweetness, but you're going to have residual sweetness from the unfermentables. Which is actually what motivated the increase in the starting gravity, um, just yeah. to, mm -hmm. to kind of end up in the same ballpark. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One, uh, I, you know, something, something you might, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but something that 
that I might even try is to brew a hot cup of coffee with the bean that you selected. And, I mean, you know, whatever you're finishing gravity, if it's going to be a sweet mead, then toss a lot of sugar or just, you know, a lot of honey into that cup of coffee and see what it tastes like. You know? Good idea. I, I might even try that. You do kind of need to yeah. see how the the coffee flavors and the the honey flavors are going to interplay. That yeah, that makes a lot of sense actually. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does occur to me though, as a devil's advocate here, you know, when we were talking to, to Eric Newquist, um, there there are a couple of parts here that are a little bit on the 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 difficult to tell side because. Like we've talked about numerous times before, there really is no accounting for taste. And Eric may not be as into the dark roast as we are, although I think he mentioned he usually did gravitate to those. You know, he His perceptions for the dark roast and, you know, good level of bitterness versus bad level of bitterness may not be on par with you know, ours. There may be a level at which we're going to find that just fine. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing is we've not sampled any of Eric's. Um Needs no. to see how those, how that coffee flavor comes through, whether it's kind of a subtle thing or whether it's pretty dominant within the the, um, the meads. I remember him talking about the uh, some of the stronger honey flavors, like the fireweed, um, still having that varietal character coming through. So it, it it occurs to me that maybe that coffee flavor in his meads is not incre- incredibly strong. It's it's kind of like well balanced. <laughs> Um, yeah. but it, it, yeah, it may be uh, a little bit less than what we're going for too. Yeah. But as you said, and like I said, uh, your first sip of the cold brew is weak, but as you sit and drink it, it builds and it gets stronger and stronger. And so by the time you're halfway through the cup, uh, you're getting a very strong, I, I guess part of it is your perception sort of attenuates. Um, but it, it, it tends to build on itself. It gets stronger and stronger. And, uh, that's the, that's the same thing that's going to happen in the mead when you drink it. Uh, you know, the more you drink, um, the stronger the coffee is going to come through. And, and I can tell you by sitting here drinking it and tasting it, uh, you know, all honey is pretty much, uh, a light flavor compared to coffee. And, um, so I can see where even this weak, uh, weak cold brewed, very dilute coffee could easily overpower most honeys. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, you may be on to something. Uh, I the just other thought, thought I had is just the, uh, the, the notion of like that Boucher coffee. And I know Chris has done a Boucher. I don't know about. I don't think Aaron has. I don't think JD has. But yeah. you do get a lot of very strong flavors out of that. And I'm a little bit concerned now that if we're if we're taking a lighter coffee approach, that the Boche is just going to totally overwhelm the coffee. So it's part of why I'm kind of thinking we might want to dial back the, the uh, toasting on that too. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you're on to something with the Boche. I think that's, that's a good way to go. Uh, but I would suggest... Uh, both of you cold brew some coffee and uh, once you select it and and sit down with it and give it a chance uh, your your first impression your first sip is going to be very different from what you're used to but but go ahead and finish the cup and notice as you as you go along how how much stronger it seems to get well, so Chris I, talk- go ahead Aaron I'm sorry oops. Sorry, I, I did just have one question about the the cold brewed coffee. So you know, we've we've talked about you're just adding either like a coarse ground or blade ground coffee to to either room temperature or even chilled water for you know fourteen to twenty four hours. When you serve it, then are you drinking it at room temperature or do you heat it up when you go to drink it? Uh, I actually, when I finished straining it and diluted it, I stuck it in the fridge to get it as cold as possible. Okay. So it's more like a chilled, like an iced coffee type of thing. Yeah. I don't know. Did you drink yours, uh, room temperature or chilled, JD? 
Room temperature. Room temperature. Yep. Yeah, I, I tasted it before I put it in the fridge, and and honestly, there's not much difference in the flavor from room temperature to chilled. Yeah. Uh, I just thought I would drink it the way iced coffee is supposed to be drank. So. Sure. Okay. But the, but it doesn't really affect. Uh, there, there's not that much difference in flavor uh, from one or the other. Interesting. <laughs> Well, I think um, I think what we're going to do here, guys, Chris had a pretty good idea last week. Uh, we're going to take a little break here, and uh, I guess, what would we call this? Uh, restroom break, I guess? <laughs> Intermission. Intermission. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Refill gonna take, time. We're exactly. Gonna, refills. Yeah, <laughs> refill time, intermission. So uh, enjoy a little little uh, lost highway from weeds, and uh, we'll be back here uh, just shortly. Green Mustang. I drive 500 miles a day to hammer out the dents in the dreams that I've got, pulsing through my veins.
Holy cow, if you could have heard uh, if you could have heard what we were talking about during the break. <laughs> Uh, we might get into that next week. Uh, the coffee saga will continue. Uh, next week, we're actually going to get more involved in talking about experimental mead. Uh, and this is the fun thing about about making mead is being able to experiment. Uh, kind of what uh, you know, Chris and I and Jeff and Aaron are doing with this coffee thing. So, but we're going to get into a little bit more detail. Uh, Jeff and Aaron are probably uh, the experts when it comes to doing these experiments. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up with a couple of them that uh, both of those guys got going. But right now, um, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about chemicals, guys. Uh, and I, I have this aversion towards I don't even like taking pills, uh, for crying out loud. Uh, and chemicals... If you, you know, and I have calmed down. Uh, Chris knows uh, knows me from another show that we did. When I started doing this, I, my kitchen was like an operating room. I mean, I sanitized everything. The walls, the floor, the cabinets, the countertops, everything. And uh, I was just a, a, a freak about... Uh, you know, bacteria and this kind of thing. And I'm, I'm kind of anti-chemical, um, you know, when it comes down to it. I, I like natural things. I like natural. When I cook, I use natural ingredients. I don't use dried herbs. I use fresh herbs. If I can't get it, I'll use something else. Uh, but when it comes to making mead, there are some chemicals that we do use that we almost have to use. Uh, Jeff, uh, uh, take us down that road. Or I well, guess it's there. It was, was it Jeff or Aaron that had? Uh, well, Jeff, let's go with Jeff. Uh, let's start out with Jeff. You know, I, I'm in the same boat that you are. I don't like to use a chemical unless I have to. But there are sometimes that you just find that using that chemical additive or that chemical agent is is the way to go and. You know, we can talk about um, – there are things that I don't quite consider chemicals and there are things that I consider more naturally derived. Um, things like finding agents like isinglass that are based on something from a shellfish, I don't have as hard of a, a time using as, yeah. um, say, you know, uh, potassium sorbate or um, metabisulfate, I think is the, the term for it that you use when you want to shelf stabilize meat. Um, just because it, it, and this is probably a definitely a first world problem on my part with, um, the idea that these, these chemicals produced in a laboratory are, um, not as natural or not as, as you know, right. But, um, well, no, I mean, let's, let's just take, uh, I mean, let, you know, the, the chemicals that we use to start out making mead with, obviously, are the ones that we use to sanitize everything sure. uh, with. And uh, I use star sand. Uh, is there any preference to what you guys, what you three use? Well, I rotate through mine. Um, usually about once a year I'll change over um, it's a practice that's used in hospitals, operating rooms uh, and, and basically you're just avoiding the, um, having the bacteria to become attenuated to, to any certain sanitizer yeah. so star sand for a while Switch over to uh, iota four. Switch over to uh, metabisulfite solution, and then back to star sand again. Now I know star sand is an acid based uh, sanitizing solution. Mm -hmm. What are some of the others? Well, the sulfide is a is a sulfur containing. Uh, uh, chemical, uh, you know, it, it's equivalent to the same thing that the, the ancient Romans did when they would burn uh, sulfur candles to to preserve their wine. 
Um, and then the iota four is it's basically an iodine solution. It's a very weak iodine solution. Um, not all that different from using betadine or something like that. So. And the betadine it, is, that, a, is that commonly used in the operating room, right, to swab down a patient before uh, surgery? Right. It, it's derived from a metal acid. Uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a metallic acid derivative. And uh, basically it just acts as a, as a bacteriostatic uh, agent. You know, really, um, I guess out of all of these, probably the, uh, the metabisulfite solution is really the only one that really and truly kills a lot of bacteria. Um, the other two uh, are very efficient at, at bacteriostatic action, which is uh, basically they just immobilize them. They prevent them from being able to reproduce. Um, but uh, as far as being bacteriocidal, um, I would say probably the, uh, the sulfite solution may be actually the best of the three. You know, when my wife hears about the metabisulfite deal, she's going to start scrubbing the bathroom with it. <laughs> oh, my God. Good stuff. <laughs> so, you know, I can see that, uh, you know, going into the squirt bottle and, uh, you know, under the sink with all the rest of the cleaning material. Um, so, basically, the three, the three basic sanitizing solutions – and then once we once we've got everything sanitized and we get our mead uh, going, what are some of the other uh, chemicals that we that we use, Aaron? So um, this is one I I've actually had on my list of questions to to toss back to you guys. When doing things like melomels, where we're adding in fruits to primary, you know, there's the risk of contaminating that that must with whatever wild yeast or bacteria is on, you know, the, the skins of the fruit there. Yeah. Um, so, so this isn't something that I've done before. Usually in, in the melomels I've done, I've always added the fruit to, to secondary, but I do understand um, if, if you're adding to primary, that it's a good practice to kind of stabilize that before pitching the yeast. And is that with, is it potassium sorbate that that's used I it's a metabisulfite. Metabi it's the, yeah, metabi oh, okay. Or, same thing as a Camden tablet, right? That, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So it's the potassium metabisulfite at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I and, think we maybe should just define uh, exactly what these are used for. Uh, the potassium metabisulfite or the Camden tablet is used specifically for sanitization uh, and for the killing of microorganisms. The potassium sorbate, however, is used to prevent uh, yeast that are already present in your need from restarting. So basically what, what happens is the, the sorbate uh, will not allow the yeast to reproduce. So let's say that you have uh, you've got a must mixed up and you just put some yeast in and then you dump in some potassium sorbate. Okay, the sorbate's not gonna kill the yeast that are in there and they're actually gonna wake up and they're gonna start to ferment and they're gonna ferment until they die. But they're never gonna be able to reproduce. So they're only gonna ferment for a little while, then they're gonna die off and your fermentation stops. So sorbate does not kill the yeast. It just prevents reproduction. And I think, um, that's, uh, I think that's a misunderstanding that a lot of people have because, you know, you go out there uh, traveling through all the different mead resources on the Internet, and you read about uh, these kinds of things, and people are often quoting, uh, you know, the fact to uh, – to add the sorbate to the to the the must to to make everything stop, and that's mm -hmm. not necessarily the case. So mm -hmm. uh, it'll stop when the active yeast die out. 
but you know it, it'll keep them from keep continuing to reproduce but it will not kill the ones that are already there yeah now the potassium metabisulfite uh will kill them most of the time yeah but there are some yeasts that are very resistant to it. In fact, there are some yeasts that produce it themselves. So it may or it may not kill them. Yeah, typically, isn't it? I mean, typically, uh, people use sorbate and metabisulfite in in conjunction with each other at the end. I know this is a common practice in winemaking too. Uh, uh, you know, at the end of fermentation to stabilize, uh, quote unquote, mm -hmm. uh, using both of those chemicals together, right? Well, I think, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer to say at the end of fermentation because you're, yeah. you're intentionally stopping it rather than letting it progress to the end. Uh, right. but yes, I think if you, if you reach a desired level of sweetness or a desired level of fermentation and you don't want to progress further, I've been told, and I've done this once, to use the two in combination with a like a good racking and a cold crash to shelf stabilize the mead so it doesn't ferment further. Yeah. 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 And it will usually work, but not always. I, um, you know, I, I don't typically do that. Uh, I let them go, and this this is a problem that I have. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's a school of thought out there, and, and I know Chris has, has mentioned this, you know, especially with using 71B. It, it cooks your mead quickly, and you can go from bucket to bottle uh, in a relatively short period of time, and from bottle to glass. I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're talking just several months. Uh, but... If you don't, if you don't use any of these chemicals and just naturally let the yeast die out, uh, isn't there a chance later on fermentation can restart? I've heard of this happening before. Uh, I've had it actually happen in the bottle uh, with a couple of corks blowing off. Luckily, the bottle was standing upright when it happened, but. Uh, isn't isn't that uh, something worth uh, noting as well? Yeah, that's uh, it, considering you have residual sweetness. Yeah. Uh, if your bone, if the meat is bone dry, uh, that's not really a concern because there's nothing left to ferment. Well, but, at, at some point, doesn't the alcohol uh, level actually kill the yeast? Yeah, it will. Uh, but if, if you have any residual sweetness at all, uh, there is a chance of a restarted fermentation. Um, and I would never count it out. Uh, and that's the reason to use the, the metabisulfite and the sorbate to, to make sure that doesn't happen. Right. Um, and of course, then there's a whole other issue of infection. Uh, you want to use the, the potassium metabisulfite or the Camden tablet, whichever you prefer to use. They're the same chemical, um, uh, in order to prevent, uh, getting some sort of infection that, that will turn it to vinegar. So, um, you know, and, and that, that brings up a whole other issue of, uh, getting off flavors using those chemicals, um, for instance, if you did a malolactic fermentation, uh, after your normal fermentation was over, uh, you may inoculate it with uh, MLF bacteria uh, in order to help soften the acidity or whatever reason. Uh, and that bacteria is not compatible with sorbate. Uh, the, the bacteria will actually eat the sorbate, and it will turn it into a compound called geraniol, and it tastes like rotten geraniums. <laughs> and once Ooh. and once it's in your mead, it will not come out. There is no reversing it. There's nothing to do to get it out. So basically, and you use and it's the same chemical that that geraniums produce. So if you can imagine that flavor in your mead, mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, so if you make a mead and you, you, you're going to do a malolactic fermentation, then you just ruled out your use of sorbate completely. You cannot use it. How safe are these? Uh, these kind of, how safe is sorbate and, and metabolite sulfide? I mean, safer than alcohol. Safer than alcohol. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the, amount, the amount used is much safer than the stuff you're putting it in. So, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, you know, I mean that makes sense too. I mean, you know, because I sit here and I'm thinking. You know, just the name itself, potassium metabisulfite. I mean, it sounds like, you know, if I was to take a spoonful of that, I'd probably drop dead in 10 minutes. Uh, you know, would I? I mean, is this a safe chemical to keep around the house? Not not that we advocate, you know, keeping things in reach of children. I'll make that perfectly clear. Always keep all the chemicals that you use in wine making and mead making way out of uh, of children's reach. But that being said, exactly how safe is it? In the quantities we use in in a batch of mead, yeah, like I said, it's safer than alcohol. Uh, in large quantities, I mean, you know. If you eat enough ribeye steak, it'll kill you. (laughs) So, you know, large quantities, yeah, it gets more toxic. But we're talking about uh, tenths of a gram. Uh, And and in some cases, hundreds of a gram. Uh, And maybe that's a whole other show that we need to to cover. But the use of uh, metabolic sulfide and sorbate is, is determined by... Alcohol percentage uh, by your acidity level, and and all these uh, your total acidity, not not your pH necessarily. Uh, well, one of them's pH. One's determined by total acidity. Um, so you know if you've got a high enough acidity, a low enough pH, and a high enough alcohol content, uh, you we're talking about hundreds of a gram. That's needed to stabilize mead. So it's a very tiny, tiny amount. Um, it's it's safer than the alcohol for sure at that amount. Some of the other chemicals that we use uh, in mead making, uh, like diammonium phosphate, uh, DAP. I don't use it. Uh, well, I, I don't make a habit of using it. I have used it in the past. Uh, and to my knowledge, it's actually used to promote uh, – uh, it has something to do with nitrogen. I know that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not a chemist. Uh, and for that reason, I don't like using a whole lot of chemicals in, in this mead and winemaking. It's out there. People do use it, uh, you know. Uh, is that something that uh, Jeff and Aaron uh, do either one of you use DAP well you know I have used it in the past um, the the experiment is still out so uh, we may see whether or not I'm going to be using it in the future yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, I don't think I've used DAP before unless it was part of those generic baggies of whatever yeast nutrient and yeast energizer I, I got at the, the local homebrew supply shop. The, you know, those, they weren't labeled, so I'm not exactly sure what, what they were, but. Yeah. It was in there. Guaranteed. Um, yeah. I've used it. Uh, I've used DAP in the past. I don't use it anymore. Um, uh, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to go as natural as possible, but uh, uh, and I think that the nutrients that we use are. I mean, you know, and here's the other thing too. I mean, I, I'm not making mead for uh, you know the general consumption of the entire community. I'm making it for me and my friends and my relatives. Uh, so I'm not making stuff that's uh, you know that needs to be entered in a in a you know, in a mead show somewhere or a competition somewhere. So 
I don't know how much DAP would have to do with that, but uh, you know, it may be nothing at all. So, uh, but it's a chemical that's on the shelf uh, that's sometimes used. So, yeah, I, I just uh, I don't worry about it because the, the amounts that we use are just almost insignificant to to us. Yeah. And uh, you know, despite what you use to put in it, you're still making alcohol, which is the most toxic, uh, voluntarily consumed, intentionally consumed product that humans probably ingest. Yeah. And so the idea of trying to be natural. Uh, it's kind of like a, a teenager who gets mad at his parents and says, I want my freedom. I'm going to go join the military. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> how much, you know, how much sense does that make? Well, it's kind of the same thing, you know. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. Well, at this point, I think I'm I'm trying to avoid using chemicals more from the the possibility of imparting off flavors than – trying to be more more natural or more organic um, yeah. in that regard. I mean, if I can be patient and let things settle on their own rather than using a finding agent, I tend to. If I can just plan ahead for about where I want to end up sweetness level or uh, dryness level rather than uh, try to stop it early or, you know, try to back sweeten, I just do that. Um, the less I can have to mess with stuff once, you know, I don't like changing course in midstream. Yeah. 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 And, and Jeff, you know, I mentioned uh, that all that stuff was dependent on acidity and pH and all that stuff, uh, which is exactly what you just said, imparting off flavors and things like that. If you are if you have the proper test kits and things that you need and you're using the right amounts, uh, there's no danger of that. So, uh, like I said, that could be a whole other show about getting total acidity test kits and sulfite test kits and free SO2 kits and things like that. So, uh, yeah. all, the, all those kinds of things will uh, add some expense to your batch of mead, but they ensure that you're using the, the correct ratio, not only to avoid all flavors, but also to make sure you're putting in enough to do some good. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, I, and I'm kind of with Jeff on that because I, you know, I had a bad experience and acid, I suppose you could classify it as a chemical. I mean, it comes in a little jar. Uh, but I had, I've had bad experiences with that twice now. And, uh, like Chris, I have, you know, pretty much chucked acid in the trash and no longer, that's not an issue anymore for me. Uh, now, by carbon. The cleaning, the cleaning solution for the Keurigs is made of citric acid. And most yeah. of your acid blends are are mostly citric acid, so I use mine to clean my Keurig with now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, mix, mix a tablespoon in a cup of water; it'll clean it right out. Now, if I you know if I do have a problem with acid, it's potassium bicarbonate, I believe, is the correct, uh, uh, and that that lowers the acidity. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. Right. And that's one that's one that I will use uh, on occasion if it gets you know completely out of whack because um, too much acid can actually stop your fermentation. It definitely can. Yeah. So uh, and you know potassium bar car- bicarbonate. Uh, what is it? Uh, it's a buffering agent. Uh, it's a um, it's a base, uh, a mild base, a mild alkaline, and uh, it, it just neutralizes some of the acid that's present. Uh, potassium carbonate has a little bit more um, action because of the molecular structure, but potassium bicarbonate is also 
acceptable. You just have to use a little bit more of it to get the same effect. Um, Potassium hydroxide is another, but it's very dangerous, and I wouldn't suggest people even using it. Is that the stuff they make rocket fuel out of? Mm, I don't know what they – no, they use it in the food industry, but uh, at the concentration that you or need that, to do uh, – Or is that hydrogen peroxide maybe? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, perchlorates, I think, are used in in, in the rocket industry. I have uh, made, I've made some rocket fuel here at home. Uh, you know, with this mead, uh, with with this mead stuff. But uh, go ahead, Chris. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, we, we've all made it. Well, but this uh, this particular uh, potassium hydroxide is very dangerous. It's very caustic, uh, and at the concentration, you know, which is like a two molar solution. Uh, you know, it, it's very caustic at that concentration. So uh, we're talking about using about one milliliter in a five-gallon batch will completely neutralize just about everything in there. So uh, very tiny amount, and I, I would not suggest using it. Uh, although it is the most efficient at what we're wanting to do, um for safety reasons, I just couldn't recommend to anyone to use it yeah. unless you're a trained chemist and you work with the stuff all day. Yeah, and that I'm not. Uh, yeah, me either. I think uh, I, th- I think I'm about done talking about chemicals. <laughs> How about you guys? Uh, it's just a it's just a boring category to me, but I'm glad we did. At least you know people who are listening will get a little idea of what some of them are. Uh, some of them useful, some of them not so useful. Uh, many of them are is up to you basically. Uh, you know if you want to use them or not. Uh, some of us choose to. Some of us uh, choose not to. Um. Let's move on to the hopper list, guys. Uh, let's start with Jeff. What's in the hopper, bud? Oh wow. Uh, let's see. I've got uh, I've got a, my turmoil mead, which is transitioning into secondary, um, and then I'm probably going to be. Let's see, well, I've got the experimental mead that I've got a blind tasting on um, the June the 11th, so that's coming up really quickly. Um, in relation to that, I actually got asked to do a, uh, a talk for um, the American Homebrew Association's Mead Day celebration with my local homebrew store um, about, uh, about um, what I want to say, nutrient additions and things like that. Um, so I'll be doing that with them, and I'll be having a little bit of that held back so that I can let people that are um, attending that Sample okay. some too. Uh, can you can you record that and uh, we can put it up on the website? For you know, time? I can try. Um, I, I'd, I'd have to see about uh, that with them. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure that that shouldn't be a problem. I don't really know what kind of uh, quality recording equipment I have access to, but we can certainly try that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Cool. Excellent. What else is going on? Um. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I've got my, my hop mead that I think I talked about last time came out really, really hoppy. Yeah. Um, that it, I, th- I think I've decided I'm going to cut that with something. Um, I'm not exactly certain what at this point, since I've got a lot more of this, uh, this experimental mead that needs to go to, um, to the, uh, mead day celebration now. Um, then about, in the planning, uh, what about whipping up a uh, just a simple traditional and uh, using that to blend with? I think that's what I'm going to have to do with it, um, and that that may be the the way I should go anyway. Because now that I remember, um, I was making this with a different type of honey from a, a new uh, beekeeper, just to kind of evaluate how I like it compared to what I usually use. Uh, so I should probably use what I have left from him to make a traditional and kind of blend those together and see. Um, 
beyond that, we also related to the mead day. Um, we, we had also talked about doing kind of a fruity session mead sort of a thing. I was thinking something with blueberries, um, that we could do, uh, just a, a quick ferment on to get ready to go in time for this in early August. Um, then kind of do an example, like how to make this, um, talk about how to pitch yeast, how to do the first, uh, staggered nutrient addition, uh, things like that right in front of a, a live audience so that everybody kind of gets a chance to see that themselves. Um, so that we would have, we would have one fermented and ready to go, uh, before we get into that. And then one, um, that we would make on the spot, essentially kind of like when you're watching the food network, they have one that they've already baked and it's ready to come out of the oven as soon as they're putting the, the one that they've put together right into the oven. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we would probably hand out like the, the recipe for that for anybody that wants to try that themselves as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm putting that together, um, right now as far as getting that into the hopper because that needed to get started pretty quick. Um, cool. beyond that, there are, are just all kinds of things I'm, I'm working on kind of in the back of my head as far as trying to scale up that, uh, the chamomile and the hibiscus to a five gallon batch. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Perfect, Aaron. Uh, what do you got in the hopper? Talk about that uh, that dry hopped session mead you got going. So I'm thinking this may be the weekend that I finally get around to uh, to putting that together here with the three day Memorial Day weekend coming up. Um, cool. That's going to be with a, a local basswood honey and. Um, I'm thinking at this point, just with the, uh, you know, the, the coffee mead coming up, I may just stick with one three gallon batch using this, um, Calypso hop. I, I'm pretty interested in, in this. I, I don't think I've used it before, but there are just some, some really neat descriptions of like lemons, cherry blossoms, black pepper, bitter orange, mint, tropical fruit. I mean, it just sounds like there's a lot going on with that hop. So Sounds um, like something I'd baste a pork roast with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. Um, it does sound really interesting and complex, though. I will be, I will be pleased yeah. to hear your results on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm hoping that they have it in stock there. Um, so, so that's, that's the hop that I'm thinking about using. Um, other than that, this, this weekend may just be kind of a mead maintenance kind of a weekend. I, I've got three of the four honey varietals that are, are pretty much clear and, uh, may get around to getting those bottled. And then I also have three gallons of a wildflower traditional, um, that, that's, in secondary right now and just about due for a racking. So Did that's about the, all. I, uh, ale yeast for that, you said, I think? That was with uh, 71B. 71B, okay. Yep. Okay. How did, how's uh, – have you tasted it? What's the initial tasting like? You know, I I did taste it. It was very yeasty when, when I first tasted it. Um, Kind of, kind of hard to describe. I, I think it, it is a much darker honey. So, in addition to the yeast flavors, kind of some, um, maybe like mineral type type flavors going on as well. Uh, semi sweet, sweet, uh, dry. How, how'd you go with that? I was going for semi sweet, yeah. and um, Honestly, I'd have to go back and, and take a look at my notes of, of where it was at the time of the racking. Um, but yeah, going for, for semi sweet there. Okay. Cool. Anything else? Other than that, just uh, gearing up for the uh, coffee boche. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Chris, uh, Doc, what's in the hopper? Chocolate and orange. That's right, chocolate and orange. <laughs> it looks, uh, it smells like chocolate and orange. It looks like Himalayan yak vomit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, no offense to Himalayan yaks. <laughs> what is uh, it? Have you tasted it? No, I'm afraid to. <laughs> oh, boy. 
We'll we'll wait. Uh, we've got about another week, and we'll see what happens with it. Yeah. Uh, and and other than that, like like Aaron said, they're gearing up for the coffee experiment. Yeah. Uh, we do need to do a quick shout out. Uh, I don't think you mentioned it, but we got an email from a guy in Australia. Yes. Uh, Hudson Parker, I believe, was his name. Yeah, and he was he was asking us a question about hard and soft water, and uh, we just did not get around to it on this show. But I promise we will uh, on a, either next show or the next one. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have to do a little research because uh, yeah, me too. that's something that I have never really looked into. Uh, I know that water is a very important. Uh, component, uh, the difference in, in waters can make all the difference in your mead. Um, but, you know, I've always, uh, with all the things that I try to control with my mead, that's one thing that I've never really taken as seriously as I should. I usually go buy bottled spring water, uh, mostly because it's consistent. Uh, oh, yeah. But we, we'll we'll all have a conversation about that and kind of see where where our knowledge stands about it, and we'll try to give you some information on it uh, in an upcoming show. But thanks, Hudson, for uh, for the email, and and we'll get to you soon. Absolutely. Yeah, water is a <laughs> a big component in in this mead making, uh, and. Uh, we don't we don't have enough time in this particular show to cover it, but uh, absolutely going on our to do list. Um, well, I don't have any Hungarian yak vomit or Himalayan yak vomit going, but what I do have, uh, and actually I don't, all I have is what what I had going before I went on vacation a few weeks back. Uh, I purposely didn't start anything other than the coffee uh, deal, which is still sitting in the gallon and a half containers. Uh, really don't know. You know, I, Chris and I talked about it. I may throw a traditional. Actually, I do have a traditional here that I can use a portion of uh, to uh, maybe cut it down a little bit and just, you know, experiment, see what happens with it. Um, it's, it's not something that I would put in a glass and drink, uh, not by a long shot. I might stain a deck with it. But uh, <laughs> you realize if you, if you cut that in half, you got a pound and a half of coffee in there. If you cut it in half, you're still going to be three times more coffee than what we're using in this experiment. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know. Yeah, some that, dilution is is at hand. I think <laughs> I do have uh, on my to do list now that I am home, and uh, and I you know the other thing that's kind of taken the place of me, you know, putting some mead together, is I've been working on my little homebrew station, and uh, I ordered another fermenter, stainless steel fermenter. Uh, from SS Brewtech, and it's a seven gallon, uh, just like my other one, uh, because I also do kit wines as well. So uh, I've got one that uh, is specifically for wines, and the other one's for mead. And uh, on my mead to do list, uh, next up is going to be Jeff's hibiscus mead. That, of course, is the one gallon version. Jeff was kind enough to send me all the makings for it. Going to use uh, I'm going to use the wildflower honey that I get from my source, Jeff. Uh, and I may be contacting you to kind of go over the recipe a little bit later on in the week. Uh, oh, absolutely. Just to nail it down and uh, eager to get that started. Uh, the other one that I want to get started uh, sooner than later is uh, Chris's sourwood honey tradition. Uh, this is going to be uh, a three-gallon batch. And, uh, Chris, do I have enough honey for a three-gallon? You do, but uh, you're going to end up on the dry side. I may try to get you another jar if I can. Well, I mean, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to the dry. I prefer the dry. Uh, but is the sour, am I going to be missing something here? No, as long as you have some some residual sweetness, just a little bit. It doesn't take a lot because it's a 
It's a somewhat spicy, sort of tangy yeah. honey. So, uh, you, you know, it, it needs a little bit of sweetness just to help bring that out a little bit. But well, uh, the sourwood, it makes a great one. And then we'll, we'll uh, discuss what you have because I can't even remember. Uh, how I think I sent you maybe... Oh, I don't remember, like a half gallon, a gallon equivalent or something. I think I have a, I think I have a gallon, I think. Yeah, I think I sent you a gallon. So, uh, we'll, we'll do some, uh, some calculating on that before you start and and go over it. But I I think you've got enough to make a three gallon batch that's going to end up something like maybe 10, 10 or something like that when it finishes. Yeah, and, that, and that's fine. Uh, you know, like I say, even in my wine drinking, I, I prefer something a little bit on the dry side versus the sweet side. So uh, that mm-hmm. might work 